Hey everybody, welcome back. So I thought I'd talk about something that has been on my mind a lot, especially in the last couple of days and feels kind of poignant and hopefully relevant uh, to what other people are going through. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that's basically in essence the the idea of the amount of loss that we endure in this. And I was thinking about, you know, kind of benzo withdrawal as sort of like a thief, you know, it kind of robs us of of so many things. Um, I can speak for myself, but maybe you can relate. I mean, I think it for sure, it, 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 it it's robbing us of our our physical health, for sure, our emotional and mental well-being, our spiritual health, um, our sense of ourselves and our identity, our vocations. Um, you know, it, for me, it's 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 been also like a spiritual um, piece to it too, where I have felt really vacant and soulless uh, in this process. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not I'm not somebody who believes or has ever believed in the idea of spiritual warfare necessarily. But if there was ever anything that was going to convince me that spiritual warfare was a real thing, uh, benzo withdrawal probably would be the thing to get me there because. There have been really moments in this when it gets so dark um, and things get so acute um, and have for months at a time, at various times in this process, um, where the only way I can actually describe it to somebody is that it feels like evil. It feels like an evil force or a possession. Like it's, it, it feels that, um, you know, and that sounds hyperbolic if you're not going through this, if you're a loved one or a family member or a friend listening, that sounds kind of crazy to think, really, like this person's talking about sense of, a sense of evil. But yeah, it, it to me, it actually has felt like that at times. And so, you know, before I became ill with and got involved in this benzo withdrawal injury and this process, um, I was, I was wor actually working and writing some books. And one of the books that I was working on was a book called The Hope Thief. And um, it wasn't about benzo withdrawal. I wasn't aware of the hells of benzo withdrawal at that point. Um, it was actually a book about borderline personality disorder. And it was kind of a play on words because I actually don't see borderline personality disorder as being um, a hope thief. I think that there's a lot of things that can actually be helpful in working with folks that grapple with that. It's a totally different subject, not what I'm going to take on here. But I might in my other set of videos that I do. Um, but I was working on this book called The Hope Thief. And then I became ill and went into benzo withdrawal. And if there was ever anything that just that I felt the words the hope thief described best, it was what I began to experience in benzo withdrawal for all the reasons that I just laid out, right? And um, like I said, I've had a lot of ups and downs in this withdrawal process. Many of you know I'm still tapering. I have a long way to go. Um, um, and there have been parts of this process where I have been completely non-functional um, and now I'm lucky enough to have moments days hours you know where I um, very much feel not like myself or healed or healthy but uh, functional and um, and that's what I want to speak to in this video a little bit uh, but certainly last summer when I went into my most recent acute crisis that lasted almost six months and I was really in pretty bad shape and in terms of in terms of what's lost um, in this um, I was watching and feeling all of the things that made me me get stripped away and I was kind of profoundly aware um, of that process happening so at last summer I remember you know my most I guess precious role in this world has been um, being the aunt to 10 nieces and nephews and um, you know, 21 years ago, my first niece came into the world, and four months ago, my last niece came into the world, and they range from 21 to four months, and all 10 of them, and they are, they make me my best self. They did 21 years ago when I became Aunt Jen, I, I entered my best self, and, um, and last summer, as I began to really feel acute and the darkness of this uh, come in, and all of the accordant physical and mental symptoms that come along with it. Uh, I was being stripped away of that role, and I was quite concerned that I might not ever be able to be in that role again. I was unable to work. I was so I was watching, you know, my role as Aunt Jen go away, my career go away. I wasn't able to write. My creative endeavors and future hopes for myself were going away. My financial stability was going away. My friendships were 
eroding because I couldn't participate. And then, then it was hard to explain why my family relationships were strained um, because they were doing the best they could to understand, but they were losing me and they didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to do and we didn't know where to turn or, or, um, I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Many of you are there now. Many of you have been there. So that's where I was basically from last June until almost November. And then things began to start to, I started to get little moments. Really, I was down in that hole and suddenly little sparks of light were coming in and little cracks were opening and the rope was coming down for a couple of hours a day. And, and this is what I want to speak to in terms of... Um, when I think about, I have a clinician friend who, who does a lot of grief and, and loss work as well. And we would talk about these questions of, you know, what's lost, which we're all acutely aware of in this. Um, but we, we don't, I don't think we have a problem answering that question. But then the next two questions are what's left and what's possible. And when you're doing grief work or you're in a grief experience, a grief and loss experience, these are powerful questions. What's lost, what's left, and what's possible? So I want to go back and tell a story from before I became ill. This was a couple of decades ago, actually, and I was um, dating somebody um, pretty seriously. And um, we, I love New England. I've always loved New England. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, but not New England. My family's from Pennsylvania, so I, I have an affinity for the Northeast, but I've always had this love affair with, with New England, the idea of it, and the few times that I've been. So me and this person, that I, my partner and I, we were decided to go on this trip and we went down to, we went up to New England and um, the last leg of the trip was going to be to go to this town that I had only been to one other time and I loved it. It's Northampton, Massachusetts, little town um, in Western Mass and uh, kind of about 45 minutes away from the Berkshires and it's like Greenwich Village. Greenwich Village meets New England is basically what it's like. And I had only been there one other time for a day, always wanted to go back and was finally going back. Well, we get there and we get in a horrific fight. And it's probably the end of the relationship, which is part of why the fight was probably so horrific. And it was just something we couldn't get out of. And so the 48 hours that I had in Northampton were pretty spoiled. You know, nothing happened, nothing, it was, they were not fun. They were pretty traumatic. And as we're driving back to the airport to fly back to Texas, I kind of think to myself, if I go home now, and that's my memory of Northampton, that little fantasy that I had about that town or the way I envisioned it or had it play out in my mind will be ruined. It's, it's, it's tainted. And so I got to the airport and I said, I'm not going to fly home. I'm going to drop you off and I'm going to go back. And I did, and I was really sad. Um, you know, driving back, getting a hotel room, you know, acutely aware that my relationship was probably over. Um, but there was something pulling me to not let it spoil this experience of this town. I didn't know what was pulling on me at that moment, but but it was it was it was enough to make me turn the car around and go back. And I spent the next seventy two hours by myself in this town, knowing nobody, going to restaurants and to a bar and the coffee shops and sitting in the park and doing what I love to do best, which is really just sit and watch people. I can sit in a park and watch people for literally, you know, six hours and I'm perfectly content. Um, and I watched the town and I took in the town and I watched how it operated and I just let myself kind of fall in love with it, which I knew I already, you know, was, was kind of drawn to. So when I flew home to Texas, of course, I had to deal with the end of that relationship and, and whatnot. And it was interesting because a few years later, I ended up in Northampton, Massachusetts, working on my doctorate at Smith College. Um, and, uh, you know, probably had I left that town with a bad taste in my mouth, I don't know that I would have been looking at that school for my doctorate. But, and it kind of fell in my lap. It was, it was, I wasn't even looking to go do a doctorate. The entire thing just kind of fell on me. And it happened to be in Northampton and it happened to be Smith and it happened to be the right school. And, I went to this town and I lived in this town for years and I loved it and it was everything I thought it would be and more. I made my best friend in the world, um, you know, during that time. One of my best friends um, during the time that I lived there and was in my doctoral program still to this day. And so um, it was a moment of what's lost? Uh, well, probably my relationship. What's lost? 
certainly those 48 hours that I was there with that person. Those were wasted, terrible hours. What's left? I don't know. Um, I'm still left. Uh, this town is still left. Um, and what's possible? I don't know. Maybe my being able to go back and, and reclaim um, and create a positive memory in this place uh, where a bad memory had just existed. And so it was this moment of what's left, what's lost, what's left, what's possible. So I began thinking about this as it relates to benzo withdrawal because saying with another story, um, and it all ties in, I promise, I'm not just telling stories. About 12 years ago, I was up at my family's lake house in Pennsylvania that it's a place again that I love and it's very special to me. And when I would go there in the fall for 10, 10 or 12 days for vacation, I was just like a voracious reader. I would just you know, sit in front of the fire, sit on the boat, watch the leaves fall, read, 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 I'd read 10, 12, 15 books during this time. And on this one trip, I read this book called The Tender Bar. And I remember exactly where I was when I finished it. I was on this couch in front of the fire, drinking a coffee and Bailey's, and it was just getting dark out, and the leaves were falling, and it was windy. And I put the book down, and I thought that was probably one of the best books I've ever read in my entire life. It was probably in the definitely in the top three of books I've ever read. And it was, again, just also captured by the rest of that moment, right, and everything I'm describing. And... Um, always like always think about this book it's always ranked up there as, as one of my top ones and so um, I get into benzo withdrawal and I notice that on Amazon the tender bar is being shown on Amazon as a movie with Ben Affleck and every time I'd see the ads for it I'd get this panicky sick feeling and that's because in this benzo withdrawal I'm not really able to watch TV or movies um, that stopped happening last June when I went into acute I ever since then I get um, I don't know if it's just overstimulation or dysregulated, but I don't feel well physically. I start to get a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of intrusive thoughts. If there's any background music, I can get very scared uh, for no reason. I feel really uncomfortable in my skin. Things on the screen get kind of blurry and move funny. Um, it's very strange. And so I was watching the ads for this movie and I was thinking, oh man, you know, I wish I, I wish I wish I didn't know that it was out because now I feel kind of this like heartbroken nostalgia, you know, and also this 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 thing that comes over me because I'm so profoundly acute of what I've lost, right? I'm so far from that person that was reading that book on the couch, drinking the Baileys and coffee twelve years ago, where I took for granted what it was to just have a calm day or an easy night or joy in simple things, right? Um, and now here I am, even on my good days, I'm grappling with some degree of discomfort all the time uh, right now. And I, don't, I know that's not going to be the case for the rest of my life, but that's where I am right now and have been for a while. So I'm watching these ads for the tender bar. And uh, I'm sad because I'm, it's making me feel nostalgic and sick. So two days ago, I'm feeling a little better and I'm like, you know, I'm going to watch that show. And I don't eat with people that I love. Um, this started back in June too, where I started eating kind of by myself because I eat different food and I don't eat at the same times. And sometimes the conversation gets too stimulating and there's too much going on. So I kind of just eat by myself and not a good thing, uh, something I need to practice doing different. But two days ago, I grabbed my food and I'm like, I'm going to put on the tender bar and watch it. So I get my laptop and I'm sitting you know, in my room eating my food and I start to watch the movie and I get about 20 minutes in and I'm so uncomfortable and pan starting to panic and I don't have panic in benzo withdrawal ironically I don't get panic attacks I just get filled with adrenaline and dread and doom and gloom and intrusive thoughts and a feeling of unreality and all of this started coming on board to the point that I was so uncomfortable I just had to turn the movie off and I spent the rest of the night just really trying to kind of get back to some homeostasis, which was impossible. So yesterday, I'm sitting in my backyard, still kind of reeling from that experience. And and whenever I would think of the tender bar, the book or the movie, I'd get this sick feeling of, oh, remember, I, I, oh, I had that panic attack when I tried to watch it. Oh, that, you know, I can't believe it. And that makes me sad. And I was just getting more and more down and more and more mired in what a tragedy all of this is. And then this other part of me kicked in and I thought, you know, honestly, I thought, fuck that. 
you're going in that house and you're going to watch that movie. And I was pre completely prepared to say I was going to watch the movie, but not in a I'm going to white knuckle my way through it because I don't think that's how we need to tackle things in this. I don't think we need to, you know, push ourselves to go to the grocery store and just race through or stay there for five minutes and run away. I, I'm not big on that because I think that keeps our brain telling us we're in danger when the reality is we're in discomfort. We're not really in danger. We're in discomfort, extreme discomfort, but not danger. So I was preparing myself. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to watch the show. and I'm going to watch it not under my covers in my bed and my laptop, but in the living room on the TV. And I'm going to expect that I'm going to probably feel really uncomfortable and, and feel a lot of discomfort. And I did. I had to work through the movie to keep saying, you know, that's discomfort. That's not danger. And if you go back to my last videos where I'm talking about like not pushing that beach ball under the water where it's popping you back in the face, like get away from me, DPDR, get away from me, panic, get away from me, headache, get away from me, breathlessness, whatever it is, the more we do that, the more that ball pops up and it just hits us harder and harder over and over. But so through the movie, I was incredibly uncomfortable, but I kept saying, okay, you're, you're, un you're uncomfortable. So what? What the hell? What are you going to do? And I'd go back to the movie. And I'd kind of let the beach ball of discomfort just, you know, float around. It would pop me and bump into me, but it wasn't hitting me in the face because I wasn't trying to get rid of it. So my point is I got through the movie and, and it, again, it wasn't a comfortable experience, but I was proud of myself for coming back because I thought, you know, if I had let benzo withdrawal define the tender bar for me that for 12 years had been my one of my most favorite memories and my most favorite book and now suddenly it was tainted um it would probably have stayed that way you know i would have spent the next couple of years thinking oh there's that movie again or oh don't say the tender bar or oh don't say ben affleck it reminds me of the tender bar which reminds me of the panic attack right like I don't know if this happens to you guys, but we make all of these associations to these things. You know, like I had a panic attack in the grocery store, and so we can't go to the grocery store. And don't talk about the grocery store. And don't remind me how I don't go to the grocery store. So I was doing this, and I, but I had that backyard. I, in the backyard, I had a moment of thinking, I have enough capacity right now. It's not much, but I can think about what's left and what's possible, right? What's lost is last night I tried to watch it, and I had a panic attack. That's gone. I lost it. I, nothing I can do about that. What's left is that movie still playing on Amazon and I'm still alive and it was still my favorite book. And what's possible is maybe I could sit down and enjoy it on some level. And so I really want us to, to slow down and think about this for ourselves in terms of what's left and what's possible. What can we, when we have a moment, an hour, a day, a week, a weekend, whatever we're granted in this, right? Whatever little gifts of light and levity and clarity and, and, a, and a lift in our symptoms that we're, that we're gifted in our recovery and our tapering and our withdrawal process, to slow down and see if we can ask ourselves the question, what's left and, and what's possible? Because it feels like it's all carnage and wreckage, but the reality is, there are people still standing that care about us, right? Even if they're new friends on Benzo Buddies or maybe an old friend you haven't talked to in years that doesn't even know you're going through it. It feels like it's all wreckage and carnage, but, but there is there are things left. There are We are still in here, right? We're covered. I often feel like if I could just unzip my skin and step out of myself, I would be okay. But I'm shrouded in all of these symptoms, right? but I believe I'm in here. And so what's left is me. I'm still here um, amidst all of these symptoms, amidst all of this discomfort, amidst all of this pain. Um, and, and I'm not just counting the pain you're in because I believe me, I talk to people. I have some friends right now that are bed bound and have been for months and have terrible headaches and have pots and can't stand up, can't even go into the bathroom, can't cook for themselves, certainly can't parent or be a partner to their loved ones or their family members. I know how dark it gets and I've been there and I'm not so sure that I won't get there again. I, there's no promise of that. But, but this video is really about what's left and what's possible because we know what's lost uh, and we know what's possible now, right? Like 
I've seen now behind the curtain, as have you, in this benzo withdrawal. We know how bad it can get. Um, and, and But I'm also always reminded that it can, for many of us, it can always also get worse, even if we think it can't. It often can. And so being able to get good at what we practice, if we practice when we have those moments where we can think about um, what's, what's not been completely destroyed in my life, um, what can I do? And that's really what led me to do these videos and to write this book that I'm writing and this other book that I've started and the other two books that I've gone back to is I've gotten a couple of hours each day where I feel okay enough. I don't feel healthy. I don't feel like me but I feel well enough to think about what's left and what's possible. And, you know, what's left is me. Um, I'm still in here, right? And, and what's coming is this process of, I think this process of alchemy, right? Where I'm, I believe I'm being transformed into my best self. Um, it, you know, it's a painful process. Um, and I, 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 I didn't ask to go through this and I certainly wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, um, but, it's the process and I, I'd like to believe that something positive is going to come out of this and I'm going to come out better if I can practice while I'm in it, um, taking advantage of even the little slivers of moments and thinking about what's left and what's possible. What can I create? What can I, who can I connect with? What can I do in this moment? You know, can I try to friend for a moment since I haven't been able to be a very good friend to people for years because I struggle with connection and, um, getting overwhelmed too easily. Can I make this video um, and, and maybe it speaks to somebody or maybe it, it serves as a point of connection between me and somebody else. Maybe it reminds me of all that I loved about being a professor or an instructor or a teacher or a clinician. Um, and so that's why I do these videos. That's why I'm trying to write. That's why I'm trying to, 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 to take advantage of these moments because I believe we get good at what we practice. And, you know, I was thinking about those those limbic retraining systems I've talked about them on another video, like DNRS and Annie Hopper has one. There's a couple of other things. But a lot of what they talk about is um, retraining our limbic system, right? I mean, we're so mired into what we've lost and how bad this is, and we're so flooded with negative affect and, and thoughts and feelings um, because our limbic systems are so jacked up and because we're... So many of our systems are out of whack. Um, but if we can, you know, what they do in those limbic retraining systems, they basically kind of flood the system with positive affirmations or imaginings of um, a time when, when you're well and healthy, imagining a time when you're not in discomfort and despair, um, or if you can, remembering a time when you weren't and flooding yourself with that. I can't really call up memories because I get too nostalgic and they tend to get tinged and tainted and dark. So I have to work on believing there's going to be a day where, you know, for example, Seaside, Florida is another place that I love. And I've had many, many great memories in that place with family and friends. And I can't call those up and feel them. Um, and so what I now do is I try to remember and think about, okay, you're, one day you're going to be walking on that beach again, and you're going to see those pastel homes, and you're going to go and have a bite to eat while you're looking over the ocean, and it, you're going to feel the breeze, and it's going to smell good. You're going to be walking through the paths between the houses and riding the bikes, and I am that, and so you're trying to flood yourself with all of your, you know, dopamine and oxytocin and all your feel goods, right? And that's what those limbic retraining systems do. And that's what we need to do with what's left and what's possible is um, take our slivers, even if they're just slivers of moments here and there, um, and, and take advantage of them uh, when they come. Uh, and they may be few and far between, and, and you may go through months at a time like I did, or some people I know have gone years where they don't feel like they've gotten a sliver of light. And I understand that. But when that sliver comes, because it will come, we don't live here forever. This is temporary. Um, feels like forever, but it's temporary. But when that sliver comes to remind yourself, we know the question, what's lost? Let's ask what's left and what's possible and try to think about how we're going to regenerate and repopulate um, and, and move back into uh, the world of the living in some way, um, kind of new and refined and imagining ourselves healthy and capable um, while we're practicing in the discomfort 
doing what we can alongside the discomfort um, to, to, to get to that best life that's waiting for us. I think on the other side. Thanks guys.